Huffington Post Religion, How Studying Science Strengthened My Faith, by Samita Sarkar from November 30th, 2015. Yes, I know, a new Kent Hovind episode is coming, and yes, I'm going to film for it, so don't get your panties in a twist. I mean, there's going to be a lot of words here from Hindu scriptures, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce them correctly, I'm sure. So don't hate me. Many people think that science and spirituality will always be at odds, but true religion must be supported by science, and true science must be supported by religion. Okay, so since this is the first sentence in the article, I suppose you're using it to lay out the claims you're going to be defending here. And the claims you've made are, one, there actually is a true religion, two, true religion must be supported by science, wait, does that mean your religion wasn't true until, like, a few hundred years ago? Or does it mean true religion must be supported by science, but only eventually, which really means you'll just believe it now without scientific support, because eventually it might be supported. I think I'm already beginning to understand what kind of article this is, and I suspect there won't be a lot of unambiguous and meaningful sentences in it. 3. True science must be supported by religion. I'm not sure if it has to be supported by true religion, just any religion, apparently. And 4. Therefore, true religion and science cannot conflict, and they require one another. Real religion is Sanatana Dharma, or eternal duty. Another claim? Okay, I'll play along and assume for the sake of argument that there's a real religion, even though you should have defended that claim before making this one. So how do you know that it's eternal duty? And whose eternal duty is it? And what is that duty? I'm sure we'll learn all about this as we go along, but I'm just bringing it up now so we remember. It is based on universal truth rather than rituals or superstition. If a religion is actually true, and you have good reasons for thinking it's true, then I'll grant that it's based on universal truth, or truth about the universe, and not on rituals or superstition. Rituals are based on your belief, and not vice versa, so I can't see how any religion, whether true or not, could be based on its own rituals, unless I guess maybe you include the rituals as part of the definition of the religion. Like for example, you're not a Muslim if you don't pray to Mecca. As for superstition, uh, surely everyone understands that you can believe something true based entirely on superstition and no good reason, right? I mean, even if every aspect of your brand of Hinduism is actually true, you could still believe it based on superstition rather than any good reasoning or evidence, making you part of the real religion based entirely on superstition. Or do you believe that the method of getting to a belief alters the accuracy of the belief? Real religion is about truth because God is truth. I honestly have no clue what it would mean for an entity that actually exists to be synonymous with some abstract label like truth that we made up. There's one more thing for you to explain by the end. When religion is true, it is applicable to the material world and can be used to explain natural phenomena. Finally, there's a sentence I actually understand. So a true religion, and by the way, it's really annoying how you avoid using an article. I mean, it's always religion and never a religion or the religion, like you're a preacher talking about how you got religion. But then a true religion contains a description of the natural world. The religion might be more than just that, but at least it contains that. So how thorough and useful should I expect this description to actually be? Should I expect that after every discovery of science, some Hindu pulls out some invention he made ten years previously using that same knowledge? Or should I expect the kind of scientific knowledge the Christians and Muslims claim is in their holy books, like that the moon goes around the earth, or that the earth is a circle? There's a distinct difference in how compelling those two things are. Here's how by taking three science courses, astronomy, chemistry, and biology, and studying three scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita, the Srimad Bhagavatam, and the Brahma Samhita, I was able to strengthen my understanding of God. Okay, introduction over, so let's get on with showing off the scientific awesomeness of Hinduism. When I started taking science courses a couple of years ago, I began with astronomy. Well, excellent, that's a very valuable subject to learn about. I'm sure you got plenty of value for We your... learned that our universe started with a bang. A sound vibration that expanded and continues to expand to this day. Ask for your money back. A sound vibration? Wow. Wow. I mean, at least the Christian creationist misunderstanding of it as an explosion, however wrong that may be, is slightly less wrong than that. I mean, sound is waves traveling through a medium. That's why there's no sound in space, because there's no medium. When scientists talk about the expansion of space-time itself, there's no wave or anything analogous to a wave. And what's more, a wave requires space to travel through, and time for its periods to occur in, neither of which you can reliably assert to be present outside of the universe. By studying scriptures, Bhagasamita 548, Bhagavad Gita 17, 23-24, I learned that through Mahavishnu's exhalation, our universe began to expand with a primeval sound vibration of Om. Okay, then your scriptures, whether they're true or not, don't remotely begin to line up with modern science, so you've already killed your thesis. 
But for the sake of fairness, let's take a look at your sources. I'm going to use the links that you provided. Your first source. Brahma and other lords of the mundane worlds appearing from the pores of the hair of Mahavishnu remain alive as long as the duration of one exhalation of the latter. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda of whose subjective personality Mahavishnu is the portion of portion. Okay, well that says nothing about the universe beginning to expand when Mahavishnu started to exhale, and nothing about sound, and nothing about Om. So it's completely irrelevant to any part of your assertion. And your second source. From the beginning of creation, the three words, Om, Tat, Sat, were used to indicate the supreme absolute truth. These three symbolic representations were used by Brahmanas while chanting the hymns of the Vedas and during sacrifices for the satisfaction of the supreme. Therefore, transcendentalists undertaking performances of the sacrifice, charity, and penance in accordance with the scriptural regulations begin always with Om to attain the supreme. Now, somehow you've managed to cite something even less relevant than your first source. I mean, yeah, it contains the word Om, but it's not linked at all to anything else that you said. At least your first source contained the word exhalation. In fact, the Srimad Bhagavatam frequently refers to the universe as the cosmic ocean, with the planets as islands. Okay, but it's odd that you provide zero citations for that. Thanks for making me do your work for you, author. But I guess what can you expect? I mean, this is on the Huffington Post, so I doubt you got paid. Besides, maybe you thought the claim was too mundane to require any evidence. I mean, it actually would be surprising if there weren't a few religions that thought the sky was an ocean, considering that it varies between blue and black just like the ocean, and that the planets sat on top of that ocean. But that's not actually what the book says, because what it actually says is much, 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 much sillier. And by the way, I'm using the version on Vedabase, which you used for your own citations, so you can't complain. So let's start with Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 5, Chapter 26, Text 3 to 5. Here we learn something about the structure of the planets within the universe. At the bottom of the universe is an ocean. Above that are 20-something hellish planets, the worst of which is, as seems to be typical of theistic religions, reserved for atheists. According to 524, above these hell planets are a bunch of different planetary systems, which are called the subterranean heavens. Above these, and below some other planets, is Bumandala, the planetary system in which the Earth resides. In 522, we learn that some of the planets above the Earth are Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury, and Venus. And we also learn that the Sun has slow, moderate, and fast speed settings, and in 52043, we learn that it's situated in the middle of the universe. The distance from the Sun to the edge of the universe is specified as 2 billion miles. The Moon is 800,000 miles above the rays of the sunshine. I have no idea what it means to be above the rays of the sunshine, so don't ask. Apparently, the Moon is the source of coolness that helps in growing grain. We learn that 1.6 million miles above the Moon is a group of many stars. 1.6 million miles above those stars is Venus, which causes rainfall. 1.6 million miles above Venus is Mercury, which causes too much or too little rainfall. 1.6 million miles above Mercury is Mars, which causes, you guessed it, bad rainfall conditions. 1.6 million miles above Mars is Jupiter, which causes favorable conditions for the Brahmanas of the universe. But it only does whatever that means when its movement is not curved, which I can't imagine happens terribly often. And 1.6 million miles above Jupiter is Saturn, which always bodes ill for the universal situation. In 516, we learn that Bumandala is made up of seven islands in seven oceans that filled seven ditches created by the wheels of Maharaja Priyavrata's chariot. The middle island is where the Earth is, and this island is in the saltwater ocean. 520 tells us the other oceans are made of sugarcane juice, liquor, clarified butter, milk, churned yogurt, and sweet drinking water. And to be honest, that makes me kind of wonder why the hell we're stuck with stupid salt water. So, the island the Earth is on, called Jambudvipa, has a mountain at the center which supports the Earth. In 523, we learn that everything in the sky orbits the pole star, like bulls yoked together walking around a central post. Now, there's plenty more crazy in there, and it's mostly an incomprehensible mess of half-described fantasy, so enjoy, audience. But Samita, are you really trying to tell me that this is what they taught you in your astronomy class? Because somehow I doubt they taught you anything even close to this. I hope they didn't teach you anything even close to this. There's a group of many stars closer to the Earth than Venus is. Saturn is 1.6 million miles away from Jupiter, an ocean of churned yogurt, and I haven't even mentioned the excruciating details on how astrology works. Sam, how are you not ashamed to publish an article online that says the cosmology in this book approaches reality in any way at all? This analogy was used countless times in my astronomy textbook since outer space is composed mostly of, well, space. Analogy? Oh, the metaphor of the cosmic ocean with the islands and the whole thing, yeah. You know, I kind of forgot you even mentioned that right around when I mentioned the ocean of liquor. 
Okay, so yeah, I'm sure your textbook used the metaphor, but probably more like once or twice, more than countless times. Although, considering the apparent quality of the course as you've depicted it thus far, uh, who knows, but... I'm afraid that cherry-picking the word island is not going to be nearly enough to make modern astronomy match the huge volume. HUGE volume of absolute nonsense in those scriptures. Although we know how our universe began, our astronomy textbook concluded that modern scientists are not sure of how, or if, our universe will come to an end. Will it expand forever? Will it end with a big crunch? Scriptures reveal that our universe will eventually be absorbed by Mahavishnu's inhalation. Okay, but you said at the beginning, and I quote, True religion must be supported by science. And now you're claiming that science doesn't support Hindu scriptures because science has no solid answer to this question that the scriptures claim to answer. You've just debunked yourself. By the way, the consensus is starting to develop that the universe is not going to stop expanding. So what happens if it doesn't? If you live forever and you see the universe never end, will you finally admit that your religion was wrong? No, you got a lot of pages to work with there. I'm sure you'll just find something else to cherry pick to try and make it seem like it lines up with reality. The Srimad Bhagavatam and the Bhagavad Gita also casually make reference to extraterrestrial life. Huh. They refer to things just the same way you do. So casually that you don't even bother with quotations and citations half the time. So by extraterrestrial life, do you mean the people who died on Earth and were sent to the Hell Planets? Or the inhabitants of the other islands of Boomandala? Or the demons and demigods and monsters and who knows what else? Yeah, all that could be considered to describe extraterrestrials in some sort of ancient Indian space fantasy. But the aliens described there don't exist, because they're described as living on worlds that don't exist in a version of the cosmos that doesn't exist. Extraterrestrials might exist, but they're not going to be found on an island in an ocean of butter adjoining Earth's saltwater ocean. And since 52046 in the Srimad Bhagavatam states that all living entities rely on the sun for heat and light, these aliens of yours are going to have to be found in our solar system or not at all if you want them to support the book. Although we have not yet made contact with aliens, astronomers are also aware of life on other planets. No, they aren't. Simply because it is a statistical reality. <laughs> okay, what's a statistical reality in this context? Aliens aren't real just because you think it's likely. It could be that almost every other planet in the universe has life, or it could be that none of them do. Yeah, we know there are lots of planets, and probably life isn't so complicated that it wouldn't happen twice, but that doesn't mean it did. As Carl Sagan says... There are 100 billion galaxies, each of which contains something like 100 billion stars. Because most stars have planets, life on other planets must exist. There's that must word again. You really like that word. You have a thing for that word. Your editor should tell you not to use that word anymore. Ah. Uh, <laughs> so your reasoning is there are lots of planets, and therefore it's not just possible, not just likely, not just almost certain but actually necessary, mandatory, that life on other planets exists. And I suppose that that life is the same as whatever extraterrestrial life is described in the Hindu scriptures, because, of course, that added specificity wouldn't affect the probability at all. The Arecibo Observatory was created in 1960 largely with the intention to search for alien life. Okay. Has it found any? No? Is that why you didn't waste more than one sentence on it? The Drake Equation can be used to estimate how many planets in our own galaxy at this moment could feasibly contain life intelligent enough to contact us. You really don't know how the Drake Equation works, do you? Here, let me help you out. Step 1. Make up some bullshit numbers. Step 2. Plug them in. Step 3. Marvel at how much time you just wasted that could have been spent actually looking for alien life. The equation depends on a number of variables, but Khan Academy has completed the equation in an online tutorial concluding that there could be 12.5 of such detectable civilizations. Oh my goodness. I guess I was wrong. Wrong this whole time! See, I thought I only cared about, you know, reality, not yet another wildly different result of that equation, but if the Khan Academy, the, the fucking Khan Academy, made up the numbers, then... Wait, how do you get 0.5 of a civilization? But of course, if they can go faster than the speed of light and we're still eating flesh, then talking to us just isn't worth their time. I didn't realize these two things were interdependent. Apparently you can't go faster than light unless you also cluck disapprovingly at meat eaters. Even if you're some weird alien that doesn't even know what meat is. Okay, so this seems fun. Can I try a few? Of course, if they can put Christmas in July by using a time warp, and we're still pouring cow dung on our vegetables, then talking to us just isn't worth their time. Of course, if they can wrap their flagellists around a water garp and frank their flumpo, 
and we're still using ballpoint pens. Talking to us just isn't worth their time. Of course, if they can flip heads ten times in a row every single time, and we're still writing blogs about science in scripture, then talking to us just isn't worth their time. My astronomy course also discussed the four types of universal forces. The strong force, the electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the gravitational force. The strong force is what binds the protons in the atomic nucleus together despite the fact that positive charges should repel each other. Meaning they do repel each other. Although without this force the universe would be chaotic, scientists have yet to explain how the strong force functions. Oh boy, here we go again. Showing the consistency between science and religion by showing their inconsistency in that one doesn't pretend to know everything and then using that to declare religion the winner. What is your goal with this article again? As the Brahma Samhita 535 describes, Krishna, the controller of the universe, is responsible for the strong force. Oh, gee, I hadn't... So, okay, so, so God done it. That, uh, that really answers all the outstanding questions, yeah. So, nuclear physics and everything, that's, that's, we're done? We're done there? <laughs> but seriously, if that book describes Krishna being responsible for the strong force, what should I actually expect to read there? I mean, personally, when someone makes that claim to me, what I'll expect to read is a description of what a proton is, and how positive charges repel each other, and how Krishna holds them together. Now, that's the minimum I'd expect based on your claim, so let's see. And I'll use your own words, even though the first ones are your interpretation and not a quote. He maintains order through his energy, which pervades his material creation. All the universes exist in him, and he is present in his fullness in every one of the atoms that are scattered throughout the universe at one and the same time. Well, that doesn't say what you said it says. There's not even a whiff of a hint of a veiled reference to the strong force in there. And just for fun, let's remind ourselves a little bit about Hindu atomism from the Srimad Bhagavatam, the same book that supposedly accurately describes the cosmic ocean with its islands, from 3.11.5. Two atoms make one double atom, and three double atoms make one hex atom. This hex atom is visible in the sunshine which enters through the holes of a window screen. One can clearly see that the hex atom goes up towards the sky. Now, how exactly these atoms are supposed to be related to what we now call an atom is a total mystery to me. And so not only is the strong force claim never made where you say it's made, but it would actually form a contradiction in scripture if it were, because the atoms that are being talked about are not the same kind of atoms that the strong force applies to. Astronomy fascinated me because the concepts discussed were so mind-boggling. Everything I learned in the course was confirmed in the scriptures, and what I read in the scriptures was confirmed by the course. Then the course was even worse than I thought, or you didn't learn much in it, or you didn't read much of the scriptures. Because somehow, those scriptures are even more out of whack with astronomy than the scriptures I normally deal with, the Bible and the Quran, and those ones are abject failures. Next, I studied chemistry and biology, and one of the first things that we learned about were combustion reactions, the burning of fuel with oxygen. Chemistry explained the process of digestion as essentially being a slow combustion reaction of carbohydrates and oxygen as reactants, and carbon dioxide and water as products. Okay, seriously, I am genuinely asking you this, send me a private message, where did you take these classes? I mean, they told you that digestion is a combustion reaction? Okay, where exactly is the oxygen coming from inside your guts? How is your body handling that level of heat? How do your gut bacteria survive? And carbon dioxide is produced by the bacteria in your intestines. Does the combustion happen inside them? In Bhagavad Gita 1514, Krishna says, I am the fire of digestion in the bodies of all living entities, and I join with the air of life. You sure you don't want to interpret that as a metaphor? Because I really think you want to interpret that as a metaphor. Moreover, he keeps our bodies running smoothly, not only by facilitating the digestion process, but also through his presence within us as the super soul. Bhagavad Gita 1323. Are you calling Krishna an enzyme or a bacterium? We don't take kindly to that round hair. Another elementary principle we studied was the conservation of energy, also known as the first law of thermodynamics. This law establishes that energy can never be created nor destroyed. Energy can be transferred, for instance from the sun's light energy into the chemical energy used by plants to create glucose, but energy will never cease to exist. Okay, so presumably, if scripture and science need to align, then scripture is going to say something like, the energy produced in the lifting of a stone will be released in other forms forever to transform but never to disappear. Or something. Yeah? Similarly, our immortal souls can never be created or destroyed. Um, that's not conservation of energy, that's conservation of soul. 
As Krishna says of the nature of the soul in Bhagavad Gita 2.20, For the soul there is neither birth nor death at any time. He has not come into being, does not come into being, and will not come into being. He is unborn, eternal, ever-existing, and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. Yeah, that's great, but what does it have to do with energy? I mean, I'm really trying to understand the stuff you say, but you never clarify anything. Are you saying all energy is made of souls, like the potential energy in a stretched spring is a soul? Or the kinetic energy of a car going down a road is a soul? It kind of dilutes the concept of a soul into meaninglessness, don't you think? That being said, although the energy will not disappear, some energy is always lost in transfer. This is the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics?! Whoa! Are we going to talk about evolution? Come on, let's talk about evolution. This explains why only a few animals are at the top of the food chain. It is impossible to support more due to the significant loss of energy at each step in the food chain, which can even be a 90% loss per trophic level. Oh, that's, um, yeah, that's not anti-evolution usage. This is something new. Go on. It is energetically inefficient to eat from the top of the chain because we receive only a small portion of the energy we would obtain if we ate directly from the bottom. You receive less energy from eating food from the top of the food chain. Um, the energy you take from eating stuff, um, have you ever heard of, like, Weight Watchers? See, the energy you take from eating stuff is based on how many calories you eat. And meat, which presumably is what you mean when you talk about the things on the top of the food chain, almost always contains more calories by weight than vegetables do, not less. But that's impossible, you say! All that energy was lost! Second law, second law! And then we all laugh at you! But you know what, I think I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, because I think that what you actually tried and failed to say is that if we ate entirely vegetarian diets, we'd actually have more total food energy available to feed the human species than if we raise and eat meat. And if I go entirely based on my gut feeling with no facts backing me up whatsoever, this could be a good point. If we didn't raise animals to eat, we could remove all the crops of hay and whatever else we grow to feed them, and replace those with vegetables for direct human consumption, which would mean we skip the middleman, and avoid sacrificing most of that food in the form of animal waste, products, and heat loss, and so on. And at least intuitively, that makes sense. But I'm not sure why you tried to tie this to the second law of thermodynamics, the increase in total entropy over time in a thermodynamic process. Maybe you just want to sound smart? I don't know. In my biology course, I learned that since plants are producers of glucose, it is most environmentally efficient to eat plants directly rather than to eat animals that have eaten the plants. It's probably plenty more environmentally efficient to eat only plants than to raise animals to eat. I mean, cows and chickens and so on are pretty disgusting in large groups and they don't really help anything. So you could have just said that, that large-scale raising of animals for food harms the environment. But instead, you went the route of saying that it's environmentally efficient to be a vegetarian because plants produce glucose. Now, I honestly have no idea how you made that leap. And I have even less idea how the second law of thermodynamics is relevant. I mean, yeah, these processes are going to act in accordance with the second law, but so is everything. It's too basic, and it's not really applicable to the point that you're trying to make. Herbivorous animals live in symbiosis with plants because we produce the carbon dioxide that they need, and they in turn produce the oxygen that we breathe in to break down the glucose in our cells, produce the energy molecule known as ATP, and power all of our bodily reactions. Moreover, our brains run on glucose and require a continuous supply. There are actually numerous citations, both scientific and spiritual, that support a flesh-free diet, but I'll save that for my next post. Lady, I don't know where you live or what it's like there, but where I live, there's no glucose shortage. You feeling low on glucose? We've got a million ways to get your fix. Saying if you stop eating meat and start eating more vegetables, you'll get way more sugar in your diet is not exactly good salesmanship. This brings me to my final point, Newton's third law, which is also known as the law of karma. By who? States that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. What we eat has a direct and profound impact on our physical and mental well-being, which is why scriptures encourage an ahimsa, non-violent vegetarian diet, for those that are serious about their spiritual development. Um, a non-violent diet is best because every action has an equal and opposite reaction, with the implication being... What? That if you eat food you violently killed, your food's gonna violently kill you? You do understand that Newton's third law is the third law of motion, right? It applies to the physics of, like, kicking a soccer ball, not some moral retribution. If you fire a gun in space and you float off in the direction opposite the bullet, that wasn't the universe trying to get revenge on you because you shot it. 
Okay, if this is called the law of karma, then I've been under a very, very wrong impression for some time about what karma is because I thought that word referred to a lot more than just Newtonian mechanics. Studying science only strengthened my conviction and commitment to this amazing, spiritual, and delicious diet. Okay, today we're doing Unit 6, Newton's Third Law of Motion. Ooh, this sounds complicated. Holy crap, if I drop a basketball, it'll bounce? Shit, now I better be extra vegetarian. It also complemented what I've been reading in various ancient scriptures, and made my faith even stronger. Example? No? Uh, well, small loss. I mean, the scriptures probably do talk about bad karmic effects for eating meat. I'll give you that one. Unfortunately, there will always be people who misinterpret data and misquote scriptures. <sighs> and who cherry-pick single words from scriptures to try to validate the scriptures. You know... When you mentioned the cosmic ocean with islands, I expected a few verses with maybe a sentence that you'd liberally interpreted, and maybe some nearby sentence or two that would cast doubt on your interpretation. You know, I'm used to dealing with Bible quotes, after all, but what I actually found was that those three words, those words that you mercilessly slapped and beat out of shape with an astonishing level of disrespect for your scriptures, and then tried to apply to science, those words were surrounded on all sides by dozens, if not hundreds, of pages of text that completely demolished your interpretation of them. Complete with detailed, if confusing and totally wrong, descriptions of the structure of the universe, totally wrong measurements of the distances between planets, totally wrong descriptions of the orbits of the sun and planets, and so on. It isn't just some shade of context that disagreed with you, it was the entire scripture. Okay, those scriptures are yours, they're, they're not in alignment with modern scientific knowledge in any way whatsoever, and frankly, they're the most ridiculous damn things I've ever had the displeasure of having to read for a video. You could have just enjoyed the scriptures as the interesting records of ancient thought that they are, or as an entertaining fantasy, or if you really insist on revering them, you could have just seen them as a giant set of metaphors. But instead, you belittled them by cherry-picking them and interpreting things into them that simply are not hinted at no matter how charitable I want to be. You claim to think the scriptures are truth, but I don't believe you. I think you think they're untruth that has to cut off truth's face and wear it like a grotesque mask. And then after you've done all that, you add a disclaimer that other people are going to try to do what you just did by twisting science and religion to fit their personal biases. You've tried to preemptively end the discussion. Now, when people call you on your bullshit, you can just assert that what you said is correct and what everyone else said is a misinterpretation and misquote. The fact that you felt the need to add this line to your article makes me strongly suspect that you knew the flaws in your arguments, and you knew what people were going to say, and yet for some reason you decided you had to publish it anyway. People who do this will always be questioning the validity of the other side, but in actuality, science and spirituality must always be aligned. I question the validity of every side. The problem for you is that the result of that questioning, if it's done honestly and thoroughly, is the finding that only one of those sides actually is valid. The scientific side asks clear, meaningful questions and tries to discover real answers based on observation of reality. Or it makes unambiguous and meaningful claims and backs them up with hard evidence and solid reasoning. On the other hand, the religious side makes a bunch of empty assertions backed by nothing but big words that may or may not form even a coherent thought. And when people point that out, it tries to steal some of the credibility of the scientific side without actually bothering to do any of the work. That's why religion nowadays tries to attach itself to science like a lamprey, and why science categorically does not need religion. And just to be clear, categorically is defined in the dictionary as without exceptions or conditions, absolute, unqualified, and unconditional. Religion has nothing to do with the tool of science, and it's worse than unnecessary and valueless. In fact, religion, and more generally religious-style thinking, is the greatest enemy science has ever faced. It cannot be anything but detrimental to both the use of that tool and to the public's understanding of the tool and adoption of a scientific, evidence-based way of thinking. You serve as a brilliant example of an individual case of religious thinking damaging a person's ability to think scientifically. Both are valid because both are based on truth. Says you. And there wasn't one sentence in this article that even tried to demonstrate that. And now we're back to the assertions from the start of the article, and you haven't made any effort to back any of them up or even explain any of them. Do you remember what they were? There's a true religion. True religion must be supported by science. True science must be supported by religion. Therefore, true religion and science cannot conflict and require one another. Real religion is eternal duty. Real religion is about truth because God is truth. 
Honestly, I don't really understand the point of this article. I think you're trying to demonstrate that religion and science are compatible, but the way you phrase it, it's based on the assumption that religion is true in the first place. And you haven't even tried to demonstrate that. You didn't even try to use that argument that science said one thing, but scripture said it first, and therefore scripture is divine nonsense that I get from Christians and Muslims all the time. No, it seems more like what you're saying is, I think science and scripture are both true, so I have to find ways to abuse the scripture until it kinda sorta maybe kinda fits science. It's very strange and very pointless and, frankly, very disrespectful to the scriptures. Honestly, you would be better off just saying the whole scripture is metaphor for something about life. Whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter. You can make up whatever bullshit you want, but the way you do it does not honor your scriptures. You barely even seem to like them, it seems like an obligation for you to accept them. And you have this chore of trying to make them fit science, it just, it's sad, why do you bother? And that's all I got on that. That last video, Joe Muslim, I made it really quickly, and honestly I hadn't even planned to put it on Patreon at first, so my patrons didn't get their mention at the end of the video. But have no fear, patrons! Logic still loves you. So this time I'm gonna read out all the names of everyone who'd normally be displayed at the end of a video. And probably butcher most of them. Here goes! Alright, so here are the people who've pledged $15 or more. Now, all of these people I have pledged my eternal non-platonic love to, but also, I've pledged to pretend that I'm attracted to them, so all these people are super sexy. But I've also pledged to pretend to be attracted to the $10 people. So obviously, at the $15 level, you get 1.5 times as much pretending as you do at the 10. James Talbot, Cameron Bond, Dan Monger, Bill Ryan, John P.K. Shea. Alright, and here are the $10 people. These are the people I've pledged my eternal non-platonic love to, and that'll pretend to be attracted to them, but like only the normal amount. Daniel Spicer, Roland P. Clark, Jade Noib, James Green, Adam... Ibos? Jonathan Graham, David Marble, George Langdon. Alright, and finally, here are the $5 people. I have pledged my eternal non-platonic love to these people, but I'm not going to pretend like the ugly ones aren't ugly. Not for five dollars. I'm just kidding, you're all smoking hot! Katarina Sabel, Drew Brown, Thomas Sandvin, Brendan John Mahon, Brendan John Mahone, Mahon? Mahon? John Wick, Luke Blackborn, and- Jesus Christ. And she Where is it? Anti Lis. Is that an I or an L? Anti Isaki Brazy. Andrew Tall. Silent Rape. Hmm. Daniel Kizau. Jonathan Mott. Chris. Cron. Oscar. Shit, I actually have to get this right. Um. Hey, Oscar, buddy. Do you pronounce the J in your last name? And, like, what, what syllable does the accent go on? Because I have no idea. I kind of assume that you pronounce the J like a Y, you know? But I, I don't know... Like, is it a Swedish name? Do, do the Swedish pronounce the J? Or do they pronounce it Y? I, 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 from your last video, it sounded like it was J. And you said it sounded like Jungle. So I'm going to go with Oscar Jungle. Sorry, man. Michael Kiram. Christian Collings. Philip Palmer, Douglas Heaton, William M. Snell, Leslie Rowan, and last but best, Rebecca Greenwald. Thanks, you guys. You are fucking awesome. You're like my inner circle of viewers. Most best. Many people think that science and spirituality... <coughs> Sorry, I had something in my throat. Many people think that science and spirituality will always...